Welcome to the eighth webinar in the ALIA series, Tools for Transformation. My name is Adrian McCurdy, and I am with Communications uh, for ALIA. And today we have Art Kleiner, who's been a long-standing participant and contributor to the summer leadership intensives with us. He is the uh, editor-in-chief of Strategy and Business and has written many books, including The Age of Heretics, uh, Who Really Matters, as well as co-authoring Schools That Learn the Dan and The Dance of Change. And he is the editorial director of the Fifth Discipline Field Book with Peter Senge. Uh, cur currently, he's actually co-authoring a book on uh, The Capable Company, or called The Capable Company. And um, viewing how their research ties in with uh, mindfulness as a catalyst within organizations. So thank you very much, Art, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. And um, <clears throat> just want to say a word or two about the ALIA Summer Intensive, which is coming up. Um, some of this material is drawn from there. And as Adrian said, I'm a longstanding participant, and I, I can't speak highly enough of the experience, the, the power of uh, being there, and the combination of um, contempl contemplative arts, um, the arts in general, and uh, personal growth and management thinking that, that is available there. It's, it's just a, one of the most powerful um, ongoing events that I've ever, uh, ever been witness to or experienced. In any case, I am uh, really gratified to be doing this webinar today um, and uh, certainly um, glad of, for everyone who is joining and uh, welcome. This is an experimental session in that um, in that we're trying to I'm, I'm putting together three works in progress that were never really part of each other's uh, development. For the past three or four years at uh, a company, uh, at my, the firm that publishes Strategy and Business, which is PwC's strategy and management consulting firm, uh, global management consulting firm. I've been working with Paul Leinwand and Cesare Minardi and several other people on um, a, pro a research project involving capable companies. and um, we're looking at the word super competitors to describe them and I'll describe what this project is about in a few minutes but that's one piece of work. I've also been working with neuroscientist Jeffrey Schwartz and an executive coach based in Australia Josephine Thompson on a project called Wise Leadership. Uh, we're going to have an ebook on that subject later in this year probably in early summer. And then I've been working with David Sable at the ALIA Summer Institute on a body of work that goes back to my own book, Who Really Matters, but also a lot of David's research in mindfulness. Uh, and we call that on becoming a catalyst, and that's the core of the module that we'll be teaching this summer. All of these three pieces of work involve a lot of um, sort of theory building and a lot of research, and they were all separate from each other. And it's only been... Um, really for this webinar that I began to think how could they three fit together and so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to go through each of them in order and uh, pause for questions in between briefly and then we'll um, use the last half hour for those who remain to just kind of talk more generally. The Capable Company work is based on a series of interviews and some background research we did with companies that uh, have reputations for being successful because they know how to do things that nobody else knows how to do or they seem to know how to do things that nobody else knows how to do. Apple being um, you know the most probably the best known example no matter which business it's in whether it's computers or smartphones or tablets or retail stores or online media it see it always has the same capabilities for customer interface and knowing what people want and does elegance in design and uh, seamless interconnection for um, a variety of things fitting together in such a way that it's built its extraordinary success on that and 
the other companies that we researched have similar powerful distinctive capabilities. A capability in this context is a combination of processes, tools, knowledge, skills, and organization that allows a company to consistently produce results. And every really effective company, we think, has a small group of distinctive capabilities which set it apart from others and which advance its strategy. They're fine-grained, they're multifaceted and multifunctional. In other words, it's not like they have a marketing capability or an innovation capability. You know, IKEA has a capability for creating very, very uniquely designed retail enterprises that draw people in. It also has a capability for the design of its furniture, a capability for engaging consumers in um, in building the furniture themselves and in knowing what they're going to be looking for, and an extraordinary capability for putting all this together in a way that um, allows them to do it at a very, very low cost with a high level of e efficiency in countries around the world. We could say the same about all of the companies we looked at. But rather than talk about any individual company, I want to talk about what we learned about building distinctive capabilities because those that process turns out to have a lot in common with what people learn are learning about mindfulness in organizations. And especially not at the individual level, but at the global and uh, organizational level. In the early 90s, Ikujira Nanaka and Hirotaka Takuchi published a book called The Knowledge Creating Company, in which they talked about the difference between explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is the knowledge that people have when they've come to do work over a long period of time. When um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about you know 10,000 hours of practice, what he's talking about is building a kind of tacit knowledge, almost like a body knowledge. So the really skilled surgeon or really you know knows without even having to consciously think about it, where to cut next, where to look next, how to move all of you know, his hands, the, the equipment. Um, a writer knows, can look at a sentence, and the problems in that sentence jump out. You know, a skilled financial analyst, the same thing happens when you know, he or she looks at a spreadsheet. A, um, an artist of any sort is, you know, kind of the knowledge of their instrument is embedded with them. You see it in groups of people less frequently, but you do see it. And it's very, that kind of knowledge is the kind of knowledge that really allows powerful things to happen. It's very different than explicit knowledge, which is captured in written in audio or video instructions, embedded in software and in processes, and you know anyone can execute it and follow it. However, the really fine-grained, deep understanding that's in tacit knowledge is not available in mere instructions. So you kind of, if you're going to build a true capability at a large scale, at any level of the organization, from the front line, you know, from their counter at a retail store, to the top of the organization where people are making decisions in the boardroom about what they're going to invest in or what they're going to divest, you really need both. You need tacit and explicit knowledge together. And many organizations are skilled at one or the other. They know how to get all the rules down and codify everything, but they don't know how to talk together. Or they're you know, composed of people who have grown up with each other since they founded the business, but they don't know how to bring other people on board. The capable companies have figured out how to build a, a kind of a virtuous cycle, what uh, systems people think of as a reinforcing cycle of knowledge creation. And they do this in a very deliberate way, and that's what we use this diagram to show. Now, this is a diagram for one capability, but ultimately several capabilities fit together in a capability system. It's not, you know, Apple is not successful just because of its user interface design. That goes hand in hand with what it knows about um, gauging what consumers are going to want in the future and goes hand in hand with what it knows about managing relationships with other uh, enterprises and what it knows about what it knows 
and what it knows about what not to do as well as what to do. And when I say it, I mean the collective consciousness, the collective awareness of the people making decisions throughout that enterprise. So <clears throat> every one of the capable companies therefore has to have something that not a lot of organizations get very successfully, which is called here an identity. In other words, a strong sense of who we are, what we do. You look at any major organization that is successful, I think. There's probably some counterexamples, but I can't think of any. Look at any major organization that's successful, government agency, not-for-profit, um, and uh, corporation, for-profit company, and you will see a strong sense of identity. Here's what we do and how we do it, and here's what we don't do. And a lot of uh, the book on the capable company that we're developing is about how companies develop that identity and then maintain it often over many many years but that doesn't make them capable that's just a prerequisite because then they have to decide in order to fulfill that identity you know we're going to make great products of a particular type for particular people in a particular way what capabilities do we need to have what do we need to you know we're, we're a restaurant that does you know premium work or we're a restaurant that's a value chain and we're providing uh, comfort and security and low price everywhere. What capabilities do we need to have to do that? Very different capabilities in those two examples. And the way that you do that if you are an organizational leader is you write things down, you codify it, you create what here in this diagram is called recipes and routines. You make tacit knowledge explicit. And then you move down, you know, around the cycle and you have repetition at scale. You actually get people to follow those recipes and routines over and over again. And, but you get them to do it, you know, in the capable companies we looked at, you get them to do it with feedback. You have them paying attention to what they're doing. You don't necessarily have them changing things on their own, but you have them reporting back what they've seen and you pay attention and you listen. And then you have this level called collective mastery where you have the senior leaders of the company really paying attention to the work, paying attention to the way people are doing this part of the work and managing um, the interface between the strategy and the execution in a very deliberate way by sort of saying, okay, people are doing this and it's not working, how are we going to change it? People are doing that and it is working, how are we going to amplify it? Having the most senior leaders of the company talking about this in addition to or actually instead of talking about what are we going to tell the analysts at the next quarterly meeting. And that then influences the recipes and routines and the company becomes more and more effective. And we have seen this dynamic again and again in the companies we've looked at. This is not the only thing we see, but this is the part of the process that has the most to do with, kind of, well, not the most, actually. This is a part of the process that has a great deal to do with the kind of evolving collective awareness of the people involved, which is why it's so relevant to this group. And our theory is, or our model suggests, that companies that do this cycle, that run around this cycle, not just with one capability, but with three, four, or five, or six distinctive capabilities at once, all coherent in that they line up with the strategy, they line up with each other, they line up with all the products and services that the company produces. Businesses and not-for-profits and government agencies that operate this way will have an advantage. They'll succeed, they'll fulfill their mission, they'll out-compete um, other companies. And they will become vehicles for making a better world. Okay. The we've looked at the recipes and routines, you know, sim seemingly simple day-to-day -day things that have this dramatic ultimate effect on the way that the whole organization works. And it turns out there are good ways and bad ways to create recipes and routines in the organizational level. And so here are six of the things that we've found that the capable companies do. They design for remarkable results. It's not like tick the, you know, 
a lot of the of what we know about recipes and routines comes out of the quality movement, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And so, you know, it's not like design an assembly line so that everybody's, you know, doing a certain type of statistical analysis. And therefore, yes, we did that analysis, we can tick the box. More to the point, have we done that analysis with full awareness? Are we paying attention to what that analysis tells us? Are we really looking at the true significance of the processes and practices that we're doing as opposed to just following the rules? You don't look for best practices in other companies. You don't try to say, we're going to do things the way everybody else in our industry does it. You do things the way you feel. You, you borrow, certainly. People borrow processes and practices all the time. You probably hire people from other companies to help you develop those processes and practices, but you do not just uh, take them on in a road fashion. You make them your own. Can practices that work for a competitor won't necessarily work for your organization. You assume everything's going to continually evolve, but you design them to be simple so that anyone can follow them. You know, one uh, sensei from um, the a lean production system said basically, if you need a skilled engineer to do this process or practice, it's not good enough. You may also you transcend functional boundaries. You, these are not, you know, within the limits of the IT department or the human resources or training department. These, you know, involve people from different departments working together. So you have to know how to bring people together to design processes, even though they come from different um, different types of training and different types of backgrounds. And you make them intrinsically rewarding. Uh, Tom Johnson, whose picture I'm going to show in a few minutes, says that working at a really good company. When you finish the work day at a really good factory, even you should come out feeling like you've been at a really good day at the gym. Uh, excuse me, Art. You bring these to scale. Art, I've excuse already me? said. Oh, sorry, Art. Yeah. Um, yes. This is Adrian here. Uh, some people are having trouble hearing you, and I'm wondering if you're able to raise your volume or uh, uh, put in. I can't your headset. raise my microphone volume, but I can speak a little bit more loudly. That sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll, I will do that. So you bring recipes to scale by simply asking people to repeat them. Uh, the neuroscience concept of neuroplasticity comes into play here. When people act regularly and repeatedly in new ways, um, the patterns of activity in their brain change. You know, things that you're learning seem unfamiliar and difficult at first, but over time, as you practice something, the physical patterns of brainwave activity, brain circuits, reshape and reform to reflect habitual practice and it becomes easier and easier and easier the more you do things a new way. And that's especially true when you're doing it a new way with other people who are working with you and reinforcing it. So the social system is sort of, I don't know if anybody's ever called it this, but social neuroplasticity is actually even more powerful, I gather, than individual neuroplasticity. And that comes into play when you repeat at scale. And it especially comes into play when a group of people at the top of the organization keep saying, how can we develop this sort of mastery together? How can we operate? How can we help? And um, help people track performance, talk candidly about problems and challenges, keep people's attention on the improvement of the work. In some companies we looked at, the senior management of the company is directly involved. They may teach, you know, two or three weeks out of the year uh, courses in day-to-day -day practice or they may get involved on a um, on the web or on uh, or in a direct electronic connection with people in the company, making sure that they know, that the people in the company know this practice matters and the people at the top of the company or the top of my enterprise are paying close attention to not just what we're supposed to do, but how we're doing it. However, this is not scientific management. Uh, some of you may recognize Frederick Taylor, who you know basically thought everything could be, everything that people do could be reduced to one best way of managing work. 
you don't need people to think, you just need them to follow instructions. That turns out not to be an effective way of building tacit knowledge and collective mastery from individual recipes and routines. Because people are just simply not controllable in that way. People, um, for a variety of reasons, it is counterproductive to treat people as machines, even highly programmable intelligent machines. There is a lot of precedent for collective mastery in the ideas of W. Edwards Deming, particularly the ideas at the end of his life around joy in work. Um, Ellen Langer, uh, the philosopher of, um, of mindfulness, wrote that mindfulness leaves its footprints in the products of our labor, and I think Deming would have agreed with that. Here's an example of what I mean by mindfulness. Um, you may recognize it at work. And what I mean by the impact of a recipe or routine when it becomes part of collective mastery. Why paying attention at work is so much a part of this. That yellow thing hanging in the middle on an automobile assembly plant is called an andon cord. It's a familiar device in uh, lean production facilities and production facilities set up with the, with the quality movement. And basically, anyone who pulls that cord, can, and anyone on the plant line can pull that cord, production will stop, and everyone around will come to the location and try to figure out what the problem is, because you pull the cord when there's a problem. So now imagine that you're at the previous station, and somebody pulls the cord. Everybody's going to try to figure out what they, let's say it's a scratch or a misplaced part or something like that, or some other defect that is out of the ordinary. People will start to say, how did this defect come to be? Where did it come from? Inevitably, they'll come back to your station. Did you notice the defect? And if you did, why didn't you pull the cord? In an operation like that, defects get picked up on and fixed, and you know, ostensibly there's no blame. Right? Nobody can be blamed for an error because we are human beings. But imagine how you'd feel if people came back to your station looking for the problem. You'd want to prevent that. So in an atmosphere like this, there's only two ways to live. You can either be completely absorbed with fear, or you can be one with the plant observing and paying attention to everything that's coming by, so ingrained in you that it's second nature to do so, with any defect or flaw leaping out at you just simply because your attention is engaged in that way, because you're part of a group with collective mastery. And that's the way these places operate. It's partly through ingraining attentiveness in the people who are there, and it's partly in having deliberate practices, whether it's numbers on the board that you know show the progress of different aspects, of either production or of um, or of uh, you know financial results, or whether it's the kind of just community-based paying attention to each other that leads people to be on when they're at work, to be present. When you have a group of people who are truly present at work, whatever you're working on, you know collective mastery can be really wonderful to be part of. Um, Tom Johnson, who made that note about, you know, who made that comment about uh, the, the, you know, being at work should be like um, coming out of a great session at the gym, is an accountant. Robert Kaplan is an accountant. They wrote a book together called Relevance Lost about the nature of accounting. And then they went separate ways and actually feuded through much of the um, late 80s and early and through the 90s. Um, Kaplan is known for developing the balanced scorecard and other ways of bringing accounting insight to bear at tracking everything, not just the financial numbers, but performance, human capability, um, quality, all sorts of you know, measures, and really gaining awareness through explicit knowledge. And Johnson essentially said explicit knowledge is not going to help you. What you want is to build tacit knowledge by managing for awareness and setting up your processes and, and procedures accordingly. 
in the world of business literature, Kaplan is winning. You know, his many, many more companies ascribe to his approach. Um, in the world of capable companies, in the world of genuine long-term success, chance that my money is actually on a combination of both of them, but you can get to the numbers through processes and practices and figuring things out to get to the level of awareness that Johnson requires, that Johnson talks about, requires a whole other way of building capability. And I think that's the frontier. And with that, uh, let me see if there are questions that um, I could answer. And I believe Susan Spikowski is going to speak for the questions that are on the floor. So Susan. Actually, it's going to be Adrian. Susan just feeding the it's questions Adrian. to me. Yes. <laughs> and thank you, Susan, Adrian, for doing so. Yeah, absolutely. So the first, the first question is actually something um, that I'm wondering. Is um, it sounds like you're talking about well-established companies that have a, a, a balance between strategic um, innovation and that they have a certain level of stability within them. Are these findings applicable to startups in some sort of way? I think most successful startups base their proficiency on a level of collective mastery that the founders bring with them. Uh, there's a book called In the Plex about uh, the evolution of Google by a writer named Stephen Levy that really, if you look at it, is a, a story about collective mastery evolving. Hmm. And I think you could say the same is true of um, uh, the biography of Steve Jobs that um, the author of whose name I'm blanking on right now. The, the head of the Aspen Institute. Um, mm. oh, I can get it in a minute, but um, that book is also a story of a company that strove to develop collective mastery. Uh, and at Apple, it, it, it took you know probably 30, 35 years to fully emerge. Walter Isaacson. So I think a, you know a, a great startup is kind of probably doing some of this right from the beginning. As it scales, however, many startups find themselves in a position where they don't really know how to expand what they do to larger and larger markets or to more than one product line. And they, you know, they, they associate collective mastery with a small group of people and they haven't thought through how to build the capacity, build the capabilities mm -hmm. to move uh, in the long run. Great. Thank you. And uh, in your experience, is this making a case for a strong leader who re reinforces identity, such as Steve Jobs? You know, I would love to believe that companies don't need, you know, sort of emblematic, charismatic, strong leaders. They probably don't need charismatic leaders in the conventional sense, mm -hmm. but every leading company that I've seen benefits from somebody who can stand for who you know can stand for an identity mm -hmm. can say this identity represents who we are and can somehow become a, a leading figure a, a figure of leadership around that identity um, stay true to who we are is the phrase we're using for this in uh, capable company research mm -hmm. and if you don't have a leader willing to put himself or herself on the line for that identity, willing to say this is what we do and this is what we don't do, and willing to translate that into day-to-day -day decisions in a way that other people can emulate, then it's going to be extremely difficult to follow through. Mm -hmm. Every case that we know has, has such a leader. Have you ever seen any examples where there have been multiple people filling that role? So it's almost like a leadership team that steps in at different times? Well, one can read about examples, you know, so, um, you know, there are examples with, um, you know, pairs of leaders. Um, one that obviously comes to mind is, is Google with, uh, with Sergey Brin and um, um, 
Larry Page. Uh, another is you know Apple with Jobs and Wozniak at the beginning, and uh, Jobs and various other people at various other times. I think there are many companies, many many companies, where there are pairs of leaders, but only one is visible to the outside, but everybody knows who the other one is when you're on the inside. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's very rare that you have a company with just one leader that is the only visible leader from within. I think, mm -hmm. you know, often they find it very um, convenient to have just one visible leader to the outside world. I wouldn't let, so to make this more practical, if I were, you know, founding a company or running a company, mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel that there was any rule book about how many leaders to have or you know, how to set up the executive team or how to draw the line between who's in the core group and who's not in the core group. I would let that sort of follow the really important decision, which is who are the right people to have in a room to talk about who we are and what we do and what we don't do. And can we have, can we get the right people in the room and can we talk about that in a way that genuinely leads to an authentic generative sense of who we are. Mm. And, you know, if you can do that, all the other questions will fall into place hmm. about, um, you know, who should be, uh, who should, who should we, who should we consider leadership? There will be other questions that come up, like who are our preferred customers? What do they, what are they looking for? Um, how are we going to manage our resources? All of that kind of thing. Really important questions. But you can't tackle any of those until you say, what is our identity? And have a clear view of that. Absolutely. I can think of a few good examples of that as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, Jacqueline wants to know, how do you help people shift to collective mastery who are in highly siloed organizations? Where would you start? I would start by learning more about them. Mm -hmm. um, where? So first of all, I would start by saying, what are the capabilities we need to build to be distinctive? And in order to do that, I would go back to that question about identity. So in other words, none of this is possible unless you know what the organization is and, and what it needs to do most. Then w when you have a clear idea of what the capabilities are that matter most, what are the processes and practices that would actually benefit that capability that we need to build and develop? And so then you have something with which to go to the people in siloed parts of the organization. Now you can go to the person in R&D and say, you know, we really need to build this incredibly uh, specific capability in um, software design for people with a certain type of disability. I'm just making something completely up. And it's not just a... You know, it's not just a matter of R&D. We need to work closely with somebody who knows how to reach people through marketing. We need, you know, it requires uh, some sort of uh, IT platform. It requires social media. It requires uh, us to learn and train salespeople in the needs of this particular group. I'm making all this up, obviously. <laughs> how do you, you know, can I get, you know, 12 people in a room to talk about this problem? And... You know, some people call this skunk works because, you, you know, and maybe that's how it gets set up. But the idea is that you're establishing a norm for collaborative work together. You're not leaving behind the rest of the organization because then you need to say to each of these people, what resources do we need to pull from each one of your functions? And suddenly you're in a, you're in a new world. Now, some companies might go so far as to assume that they need to reorient the hierarchy but I think in most organizations, they already know how to do this. They just don't have, you know, what they, what they lack are two things. The willingness to take the time to put people in a room and learn how each other thinks, and the willingness to invest in the capabilities they really need rather than trying lots of things that come to their desk, you know, and sort of making sure that nobody walks away disappointed. In order to do this kind of development, you need to invest in these areas that matter, and that probably means disinvesting in other areas that many functions hold on to because they think that's what their success depends upon. So you have to 
at the same time you're saying yes, say no to make this work. If you're getting the impression that lots of different aspects of things are interrelated, as you already know if you work in a large organization, yes, absolutely, and you need to address that directly. So a silo problem is not just a silo problem. It's a problem of resource allocation. Great. Thank you. Now we have a question here from Daniel. What has your research revealed about the dynamic tensions that exist between collective mastery and the need for a traditional hierarchical leadership structure in order to execute and be accountable? So the question is, what has our research showed about the fact that collective mastery is often, often requires activities that run counter to some of the things that get communicated up and down a hierarchy? And we, we're going to need to make this the last question, actually, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that when we talk about um, organizational circulatory systems. But for now, let me say that the person who is operating this way is operating as a catalyst for a different way of acting. Now, we don't want people to put themselves on the line and threaten their livelihood. So you have to have a certain kind of, um, my phrase for this is, uh, insouciant savoir-faire. You have to be able to blithely know when to regard the hierarchy and when to pursue other ways of getting your point across. And you have to be what we call a um, wise advocate within the organization. And so what I'd like to do is move on to the other two parts of this um, program and then we'll have time for questions uh, in the last half hour if you stay with us. Okay. Is that okay, Adrian? I'm going to move on. Absolutely. So, um, as I said, I've been working with Jeffrey Schwartz, who is the author of a book called You Are Not Your Brain, the co-author of a book called You Are Not Your Brain, and um, Josephine Josie Thompson, who is a um, who is a executive coach and has worked with a lot of these concepts. And there is. Um, you know, we say that the brain is plastic, the neuroplasticity is real. People can learn to um, reorient their habits. But you don't, it doesn't just happen. It requires conscious attention. And there are three processes or practices in this conscious attention. And, you know, so one of them is relabel. In other words, um, I can't work across, I can't develop collective mastery because I don't have time. That's a message. That is a message in your brain and in the brain of the uh, collective organization around you. It is something that people are saying to each other all the time. You can't train people to operate differently. Don't even try. Another message. That's just reality. That's just the way it is. You know, the world here, you know, we're doing business in XYZ, developing, you know, emerging market. Everybody's so corrupt, we can't change that. Another message. So the first thing you need to do is relabel that these are messages. They may or may not be true, but until you test them, you don't know that they're true. And until you look clear, clearly at them and recognize that they're just messages, they're just thoughts, they're not reality, they're not even you. They may be your thoughts, but they aren't really necessarily how you look at things. Until you recognize that, you can't move forward. So the first thing is to say, anytime you're saying, I can't, the hierarchy won't let me, this is not possible, we're limited, or conversely, you know, it'll be easy, there's no sweat, we can just introduce, if we build it, they will come. These may or may not be true, but they are messages, and they need to be seen as such. And if they're holding you back or moving you in a counterproductive direction, then it behooves you to think about what those messages might say if they were more constructive, which is the second step, reframe. Replace or recast deceptive messages in more constructive ways and align your thinking and behavior to these new perceptions. I know that people can work together across boundaries because I've seen it. I might not think about it very much, but I've seen it. 
I know that we can get this, you know, to happen even though the hierarchy hasn't approved it because I've seen it or I know that it's happened in other companies or I know it could happen if we figure out a way to make them, you know, understand uh, that we've thought about their concerns and, 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 and if we address their concerns up front. Or maybe we haven't really asked what their concerns are. Before we assume that they're going to shut us down, whoever they might be, and it's not always the top of the organization, often, often it's somebody in the middle. Before we uh, assume that they're going to shut us down, let's ask what they really care about. Let's reframe. And then finally, once we've got a reframed message that really works, then just like we repeat the um, you know, the recipes and routines, but keep adjusting them to fit reality, we refocus. We build the new habit of thought to go with our new habit of action. And we practice these new forms of thinking with attention and commitment until they become our new second nature. Instead of our second nature being, this won't work, our second nature is, we know how to do this. I can do that. Remember that song from... Um, chorus line where the dancer, you know, runs up the stairs. His sister doesn't want to go to dance class, but he walks in and he knows just what to do. I can do that. We can do that. A new kind of refocusing. This is really difficult to do. Um, among other things, if you're smart enough to do it, you're probably smart enough to say, I shouldn't have to do this. But unfortunately, you do. You have to put conscious attention into relabeling, reframing, and refocusing, which is where the meditation practice, the um, mindfulness practice, contemplative practice really matters because that is one, one of the effects of that kind of practice is that it makes people more capable at relabeling, reframing, and refocusing their thinking. When you do this, uh, Jeffrey refers to the part of your brain that is reframing as um, the wise, uh, the the uh, the wise advocate, or Adam Smith called it the impartial spectator. The part within your brain that sort of says, you know, actually you can do the right thing this time. You know, the little Jiminy Cricket character, but the 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 part of your brain that sort of moves you towards a more effective way of, of uh, acting and operating. And one of the interesting things is that there's an as above, so below kind of, or so below, as, as below, so above kind of aspect to this. If some part of your brain is acting as a wise advocate, you can play that role for the organization at large. And the really great leaders, you know, are not the people who are charismatic, although that too. Not necessarily even the people who are effective, but the people who know how to consistently be a wise advocate for the rest of the organization. Who know how to put in ma into practice the, the circuits of conversation that are like circuits of thought that continually lead the organization to more constructive thinking and action. And that might turn out to be a critical component of collective mastery. So I want to just, that was the part of the work that um, was uh, part of our, um, our work with Jeffrey Schwartz and that's what the ebook that I'm working with uh, Jeff and Josie Thompson on. Uh, it's not quite ready yet but um, we'll let people know when it is. And um, I could probably take one or two questions about that. Maybe one, just one or two questions, if if you've got them, Adrian. If there are any. Hi, sorry. Just hold on a second. Just looking for questions here. Yeah, I didn't mean to sort of shift oh. gears. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm actually just going to go with the first question I see here. Uh, can you? Ex this one is from uh, Leslie. Can you explain how a silo problem is a problem with resource allocation? Yes. Um, I need to work together with you. I am, you're in IT and I am in training and development. We have never done this before, but we're going to create a new app for people in operations 
that is going to combine operations and marketing. So we need to sit down with somebody in operations, somebody in marketing, somebody in IT, and somebody in learning and development. Now you know as well as I do that the way this is typically going to work is we're all going to get together on a conference call. And we're all going to get through, you know, certain things, and then we're not going to have time to follow it because nobody's going to take us off of our existing 17 other projects. And therefore, we're going to do this, you know, between 8 p.m. and uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, shifting it from one email address to another to another. We're going to get up. We're going to get something that's just good enough. We're going to introduce it. Nobody's going to give the time it requires to it and it's going to fall apart. As opposed to what would it take to have us in a room together for a full week where we can ignore everything else that's on our plates. It's going to take resource allocation. It's going to take somebody being assigned to those other projects for us or it's going to actually take saying those other projects don't get resources anymore. They're not necessary. Great. Is your organization you. willing to do that? If it isn't, it has a resource allocation problem. Mm. Maybe one more question? Okay. Uh, this one is from Subir. What kind of performance management system should be supportive to build collective mastery? <laughs> um, rank and Yank, where the, top ten, where the bottom 10% are uh, forced out of the organization every, um, every year. No. Uh, we're actually working on an article with David Rock for Strategy and Business on this subject, and um, I'm, it's early enough in that article that I don't want to um, say too much about this because I have a feeling that our understanding of it is still evolving. Mm. But uh, the one thing I will say is David's looking. David, who is the uh, director of the Neuroleadership Institute and a major figure in um, the um, application of neuroscience to management thinking and practice, uh, has a is is putting forth a point of view in which he talks about the fixed mindset in which you know human nature is fixed and there's only so much capability you can build versus the growth mindset and. Uh, a performance management system that is not doesn't just pay lip service to the growth mindset but says you know people can learn and develop and in fact that is a a core part of building capabilities a um, something of that nature is probably required in a performance system exactly what that means I'm not sure we've got 10 more minutes so let's move to um, the last part of this and this is the part I've been working on with David Sable and um, this goes back, some of this goes back to a book I published in 2003 called Who Really Matters. Uh, we talk about the core group but essentially Sherwin Newland, who recently passed away, a Yale uh, surgeon actually and a uh, very um, well regarded uh, medical popular writer about medicine and um, death and dying wrote this paragraph which is you know he, he was talking about a living organism and he said that to coordinate all the instabilities in all the cells of the human body requires that the far-flung parts of an organism be in constant communication with one another over long distances as well as locally to me this has always been a very powerful metaphor for an organization which I think is alive in the same way that uh, a living organism is, you know, composed of circuits of communication. So is an organization, and there are at least four. Um, there's the hierarchy, in which you know it transmits anything that can be aggregated. If you want to grow, you build a hierarchy, and you send numbers up the hierarchy because the hierarchy exists to compare pieces and make sure that they can operate in the same system but you don't ask for advice from your boss in a hierarchical fashion you may ask for advice from your boss but that's because you and your boss are in a network networks are um, 
webs of direct person-to-person -person communication within an organization. That's how capability gets transmitted, through informal conversation. It's analogous to neural structure. It transmits anything that can be understood. And then, in addition to that, there's the market, which is a lot of what we talk about when we talk about building a capability. How do you know, how does money, materials, work, input, output move through a system? And can we make that system more effective and more efficient? Can we create the capability that, um, and you know, in every step of the process, there is a statement about implicit value. You know, the steel is worth a certain amount before it gets shaped into a fender, and it's worth more when after that but then it's worth even more when it's part of the car. But then, when it's hit by another car, it's worth less. And every step of the way, the value of something is part of the decision-making that, that relates to where it goes next. And the more explicit that is, the more effective and efficient the flow of work is. And then the fourth part of the process, the part that I wrote about, is the clan or the core group um, structure, which, you know, what matters in organizations a lot of times is legitimacy, not authority. So when you have to make a decision, if you're in an organization, you know that most decisions are not made based on, you know, its impact on the bottom line or, you know, how it's going to affect people or what it does for the customer. You know that you're sitting there going, what does Joe think of this? How does it fit with Sally's plan? I don't want to be the one to walk into Sheila's office and tell her it's not going to happen. Those, you know, Joe's, Frank's, Sally's, Sheila's, all the people that you consider important are living in your mind. Representations of them are living in your mind, and you're making decisions accordingly. And everybody around you is making decisions the same way. And in fact, you may be one of the people living in their mind. I don't want to walk into Art's office and tell them I let him down. Now, either that's because they know that I'm, you know, going to, there will be repercussions, or I'm above them in the hierarchy, or it's just not done, or I'm writing their appraisal, or they may in fact feel that I'm, you know, a, a, a wise advocate, a voice for, um, you know, the, the effective future of the organization, and therefore they don't want to do it. But for whatever reason, if I'm in somebody's mind, then I'm part of their clan structure. And so at any given time, you're navigating a hierarchy, a network, a flow of work or market, and a flow of allegiance or flow of legitimacy or clan structure. And it's really helpful to know which is which and to know how to approach in your organization, which might be a little different than other organizations in terms of how these circulatory systems function and in some cases they're blocked, in some cases they're flowing smoothly. Um, David and I talk about being a catalyst, playing the wise advocate, who then, you know, learns to operate on these four dimensions using uh, the contemplative skills and the conversational skills that allows you to raise empathy, foster consciousness, build commonality, add, you know, effective discipline, intervene effectively, and learn as we go. And this is a lifelong endeavor. Lots of people have built little bits and pieces of this body of work. And we're learning as we go all the time. And some of this knowledge goes back a very long way to antiquity, and some of it is are things that we really are only learning are important as we understand, you know, through neuroscience research, through social network research, and through organizational practice as, as we learn what, and through the theorists like Elliot Jacks and um, Karen Stevenson, social network researchers, and Alfred Chandler Jr., and many, many others. So, and Nanaka and, Tutu, and Nanaka and Takuchi and, and on and on. So uh, putting that all together, um, Adrian, I'm going to pass it back to you. Uh, my email address, if you're interested in more information, is art.kleiner at strategyand.pwc.com. 
You can also go to our the website for strategy and business, which is www.strategy-business.com. Um, you'll see blogs by me and many other management luminaries there, and we're expanding and uh, trying to get better all the time. And I'm also going to be a highly enthusiastic participant in this summer's Alia Institute. Adrian, back to you. Great. Thank you, Art. Okay, perfect. Well, um, please stay with us if you have the time for another half an hour where we can actually hear your voices and have more of a dialogue feel to this conversation. Uh, the Alia Summer Leadership Intensive, which Art was speaking about, he actually has two modules. So that's um, two opportunities to spend six hours or even 12 hours working through these various um, um, concepts and ideas that we spoke about today. The first one is called Catalyzing Organizational Change in Complex Organizations. And the second one is Generative Conversations, Interacting with Mindfulness. And David Sable, who I see is also on this call, he will be the co-facilitator for those. And uh, the Alia Summer Leadership Intensive, in case you are new to Alia, is a wonderful opportunity to experience what it's like to have a container that holds mindfulness practice. And um, so you can really work on your personal reflective practices in the morning, and then it weaves it into mindfulness um, modules that also have applications in uh, whether it's embodiment or whether it's uh, to your your workplace and then also in the afternoons there's more of the bigger picture bigger systems thinking perspective as well and we have over 30 amazing hosts uh, for this program could you please put on to the next slide art yes great and uh, so there's also 11 case studies for one of the afternoons that you can choose between. Art will be having one of them, and his is on the Capable Company, which we discussed today, and there are many others as well. And uh, for, you know, um, if you're interested, we're looking to have, uh, inclusivity is really important to us, and we would like to have more scholarships available to people so that people from, any kind of, whoever's interested in coming can essentially come. So for donations of $75 or more, uh, you'll have access to a six hour webinar series that we had last fall called Mindfulness and the Warrior of the Heart, or and the Warrior Heart of Leadership, which is by Michael Chenda, my, excuse me, Michael Chender, Susan Shea, and Alan Sloan. And uh, now, Art, did you have a few, did you have an inspirational thought to share with us before we move on to the discussion? <laughs> um, thank you for putting me on the spot. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really grateful for conversations like this. Uh, it may or may not be obvious this, you know, there, we've been working on and thinking about ideas like this for a long time. But this is actually the first time that I've had an opportunity to think about them in context with each other. And as we've been talking, and particularly with the questions that people are asking, I'm I'm realizing the you know the immense number of possible connections that exist. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Elliot Jacks, and he said, "Management today is where the natural sciences were before the discovery of the circulation of the blood." In other words, we're still pretty ignorant about how organizations work and how human systems work. But I think we're learning more all the time. And partly it's happening through sessions like this and especially through the participation of people involved. So I'm really grateful you know, to Susan, Adrian, and everyone from Alia Institute who has made this happen, um, Julia, and, uh, and to everybody who's attended. And, uh, look forward to whatever happens next. Great. Thank you, everyone who's joined us. And thank you, Art. And uh, if you just stay with us, you're welcome to join in the conversation. If you are on a computer, 
what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to raising hands so that we can hear your voice and have more of an interaction or interactive feel. So if you go to the control panel on the computer, there's a place where you can raise your hand. And if you've written a question and it hasn't been asked yet, then please feel free to do that as well. And since I don't see any hands raised just yet, we will go ahead and ask a question from David Sable, who's your co-facilitator. Okay. Yeah. Now he said, attention density sounds interesting, but what does it mean to systematically change the way you respond? Attention density is a neuroscience oriented concept. Um, and I hope I do justice to it. Essentially, we know that thinking in a new way changes neural pathways. That has been demonstrated in a variety of contexts. When you are conscious of the fact that you're thinking in a new way, when you say to yourself, I am thinking in a new way and this is actually changing the way I operate. This is, um, you know, this is not just me refusing the temptation of you know whatever addictive thing I used to do or whatever counterproductive thing I used to do but this is actually me rechanneling my thoughts and it's going to be easier and easier for me to operate in a more effective way from now on that is another level of attention being applied sort of meta attention and the more that I can do that the more that I, the more frequent my ability to rethink that way and the more conscious my awareness is of the fact that I'm rethinking that way, the higher my level of attention density. And that's going to make it more effective for me to make this change. That's, it's the equivalent of, you know, if you're, if you're trying to build muscle by working out, you know, it's very helpful to think about the sequence of your, you know, your, your activities in the various um, ways. It's very effective to have a trainer and it's very effective to have somebody saying you're doing this because it's going to improve this type of muscle or coordination or what have you. But very similar. Attention density is a way of managing the effect of your own um, self-awareness. Uh, self so the next question is uh, from Bob. Have you looked at public sector organizations in this way? It seems that public problems are often are, are too complex to allow workers to feel happy about their con contributions. Uh, um, I think that is a major topic. There's a great book called Bureaucracy by James Q. Wilson. Um, which has one of the most powerful lines about public sector work I've ever seen, and it's buried in the middle of the book, I think actually at the end. He says, if you want effective government, you have to deregulate the government. In other words, you have to allow people to operate with, uh, he doesn't say this, but I would say, uh, you have to allow people to operate with collective mastery in uh, large government agencies. And the funny thing is that a lot of them do. Right, um, but they either do it under the radar, or they are given the blessing to do it because they want to create something extraordinary, which we then later becomes a historical thing, like NASA putting someone on the moon, or you know, TARP uh, keeping the government from in keeping the ec economy from going under a second uh, depression, or whatever it may be. And it may turn out to be controversial later because people don't necessarily like government to act so overtly and effectively. Um, I think it's possible to manage this dilemma. But I would be, it would be very presumptuous of me to imply that I have any clear, I think I have a very vague idea of what would be involved, but I would, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are a lot wiser about this than I am, and I would want to know what they think. 
and we've we've just hit the limit of what I feel like I can say with any kind of uh, with any kind of, uh, of authoritativeness. But I think there is an answer out there, and I think people have it. I just think that it, the right people have not been brought together to ponder the right question in the right way, to my knowledge. If they are, you know, if somebody wants to organize a really authoritative roundtable with the right people in the room, I'd certainly be interested in knowing about it and conceivably in publishing the results. But it would really have to be the right people. Yeah. And um, so clearly it's a very good question in that case, yeah. right? <laughs> so for everyone who's tuning in, let's let's think about that. Okay. So we have another question here from Nick. Have you considered a simple metaphor? The overhead projector where attention, KPIs, real-time metrics, content processes are overlaid uh, to allow perception from multiple simultaneous perspectives. In my experience, the multiple perspectives forms a self-negotiated group mastery. It's interesting. Um, I think multiple perspectives are an inherent aspect of recipes, routines, repetition, and collective mastery. And I think there are very few cases where it's as simple as becoming aware of each other's perspectives. You really have to work together. So if the metaphor of the overhead projector gets across this idea of working together in an ingrained and ongoing fashion, then I'm all for it. Um, my association with the metaphor of an overhead projector is it's more static than that and it doesn't get that idea through. So I'd want to know more about how to make that metaphor work in that context, purely rhetorically. But I think the idea of finding a way to communicate the real effective use of multiple perspectives and development of multiple perspectives over time, I think is a really good um, uh, thing to uh, bring out. Absolutely, yeah. Now we have uh, Jacqueline who is I'm just unmuting her right now. Jacqueline, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> we can. An audio that's working. <laughs> yeah. We call it technological uh, mastery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I really appreciated the way you would use in this talk mindfulness as sort of a touch point for the different facets you were bringing out. And, and so I was just wondering, in the capable companies you've studied, um, what mindfulness practices have you observed? Huh. Um, we didn't actually ask about mindfulness, so it's not like we said, you know, do you have, you know, contemplative practices? And some of the companies, I think, probably don't, wouldn't take the idea of a mindfulness practice that seriously, um, and others would. Since I haven't asked them, I, I don't want to name names, not even to guess, but what I will say is that all of them take their culture very seriously. Um, just about all of them, when we asked, you know, what's your greatest asset, just about all of them said, it's our culture. Interesting. And, you know, some companies, most companies probably wouldn't say that. They might say it's our people. But many senior leaders feel that the culture of the company is actually holding them back, you know, because the culture is resistance to change or, you know, people just doing what they feel like doing or silos or whatever it may be. These companies felt like our culture is moving us forward. And that suggests that part of their culture is the ingrained practice of awareness and um, self express not self-expression, but awareness and uh, continual improvement. Continual improvement requires awareness. Now, whether you call that mindfulness, whether, you know, one of the interesting questions is, in a company which is building collective mastery, do you depend on individuals' mindfulness practice, or do you make simply the process of being at work a vehicle for mindfulness. Um, speaking for myself, 
you know, my day job, my functional job, involves editing. And a really good editing session is like contemplation. It, it, it has some of that same quality. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way, but when it happens well, it feels like, you know, coming out of it feels like coming out of a, a recession where I've been, you know, sitting in um, just with my thoughts. And that, I suspect, is true for a number of, I imagine that's true for a really good programmer doing coding. I don't know, because I'm not one. But uh, I imagine that's true for a variety of, um, of work-based activities. And, you know, a really good conversation, a really good dialogue, a deep dialogue, uh, has some of that same quality. So maybe it's possible to build those experiences into the flow of work without being intrusive and, without, and cultivate the attentiveness and awareness of people and then make it easier for them to bring that into other parts of their lives. Next question, I guess. This is David Hudnut. Hi, Art. Hi, David. You are speaking. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Um, I, I was intrigued. Uh, I'm thinking about building collective mastery and then the way that each individual that's part of the collective can um, contribute to that. So I'm going to your, one of your last slides where you talked about intervening in sequence. And it just crossed my mind as I was looking at that to think that um, would people's capacity to intervene in sequence be influenced by their own development level thinking in terms of Elliot Jock's work mm. and then I wonder if in a uh, organic in a, in a living system if if things really are sequential or if that's not more like a mechanical model and then finally if um, if we're thinking of some time horizon of our interventions then is a mindfulness practice something that potentially might help people shift their even even take a development mental step in their own time horizons uh, you know, with respect to what Elliot Jock has said about that. So th those are kind of, that's my question ensemble. Um, okay, there's a lot there. I'm going in reverse order. Um, Elliot Jacks did not believe it was possible to speed up mental development. Mm -hmm. He believed it was possible to slow it down, but not to speed it up. Um, I think David Sable could speak to this more directly than I could. Um, I suspect that there are ways of really enhancing um, human growth and potential through contemplative mindfulness, um, but I'm not close enough to it to, to be able to really say more about it than that. Um, I know David has um, looked at that in some depth, okay. and, and many others have as well. Um, your middle, David Hudnut, could you Please repeat your second question. I, uh, <laughs> I it's remember about the first being one that, it's it's about being a wise um, advocate, intervener, or wise advocate, and and intervening in sequence, so that each new move builds on the previous ones. And then I was thinking about a system being a living system as opposed to a mechanical system, and what does sequence mean in a living right. system? Got it. Okay. So my use of intervene and sequence, there's a lot packed into that. And a lot of that phrase is based on the work of a, um, a, a, a organizational intervening model building specialist named David Cantor, a theor an organizational theorist, who's just starting uh, actually the David Cantor Institute in uh, the Boston area. And intervening in sequence, to me, means having the deliberate ability to kind of read the room, make the right move, so that you continue to move the group along in a particular way, using your own um, 
spoken interventions deliberately and catalytically. You know, in other words, to be conscious of the change you're making in the larger system, and then each step of the way making that change um, happen. So, uh, making the next change happen in a way that help continues to help the organization move along. Now, so is it possible in a living system? Is it mechanistic? The way David Cantor does it, it's not mechanistic. Mm -hmm. But then that takes us to your first question, which is what do you have? What kinds of capabilities do you have to have in order to be that kind of intervener? Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of thing that you know you need to be a genius um, facilitator or, or an idiot savant, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> or or can you actually be trained to do it? And I think. Um, that's one of the things that David is, in fact, working on. David Cantor is working on. Um, it's also probably one of the things David Sable is working on, and probably many others. Um, I think our knowledge about this is still very young. I think one of the problems is that insights about how to be this kind of intervener are a lot like insights about education. The insights come to people working on such a small scale that it's very difficult to learn from collective experience. And, and there are, it's not so much that there are too few theories, but the theories are not as comprehensive as they need to be. And they're not, it's not easy to test them. So, David Canner's theory, which involve, uh, which we actually use in our module a little bit, or, or although we we may redesign around it, um, involves teaching people or learning to be deliberate about when you move, when you oppose, when you um, sort of bystand or follow the role you play in a conversation, how you speak within that conversation. Um, and he argues that you know one can be very conscious of this of the presence you have and the way in which you interrelate in a the conversation. There are many, many other possible variations on the way people intervene, as you know, David, and, mm -hmm. and there are um, and many, many bodies of work. And all of them are probably better than nothing. And some of them are better than others. And you know, it would be interesting to know if there's anyone who has had the experience of working with all of them or enough of them with enough depth and enough background to, to actually help us judge, you know, which makes more sense in which contexts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, the uh, editor of a, man, of a medical journal in the 17th century trying to decide which barber surgeon, you know, to write about, you know, and, and whose leeches to recommend. <laughs> uh, and then in a way that's what your question makes me feel like, you know, uh, in the absence of that kind of comprehensive knowledge, um, we look for what we can and we work with what we can knowing that, you know, our collective understanding is just building over time. Great, thank you. I guess next question. Before we actually get to the next question, there was uh, someone wrote, um, they were wondering about a book on bureaucracy that you mentioned. If you could just. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's an old book by another writer who has passed away recently. Uh, his name is James Q. Wilson, and it's called Bureaucracy. Um, he is a, uh, he's, he's typically known as a very conservative writer, um, and he was. But he wrote a book in which he said, okay, I'm going to take my own challenge, sort of, and try to find several government agencies that actually worked well over the course of history and uh, see what they have in common. And what he found they had in common was a clear mission, uh, you know, a reason for existence and uh, kind of collective mastery. Um, it's a very, it's a long book and a very detailed book. Um, and it's worth looking at. And there, pro there may be other books about how to have an effective government, uh, but I don't know of any that, are, that were as effective as this one, partly because 
you know, it, it lives at the nexus between strategy and execution, which is where the most interesting organizational ideas seem to emerge. Wonderful. Next Thank question. You. We'll just move on to Samantha Mack. Hi there. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned sort of related to the sequence of events. You mentioned a dialogue uh, about identity as sort of the highest level question that an organization needs to um, tackle. Yes. Um, before they can really move into the the tactical level of change and systemic change. I was wondering um, regarding the notion of sort of pain tolerance and um, what sort of conditions need to exist um, to spur a discussion about identity right. and then prompt this in the first place. Right, so how can we possibly have a discussion about our identity when we can't even talk about, you know, how to reform the performance management system? But how can we, <laughs> how can we reform the performance management system when we can't even talk about our identity? Which comes first? Um, I am drawing on the work of um, Paul Einwand and Cesare Minority in their book, The Essential Advantage, which um, was published by um, my firm, Strategy and, several years ago. And they talk a lot about coherence, the fit between uh, the overall strategy, you know, how you go to market if it's a business, and the capabilities you have and all of the products and services. And the, our body of our research after that, you know, sort of built upon that concept. So, and they, you know, anyone working with organizations is working with a group of people who may or may not be willing to take that level of strategic focus because it's tough. And it's tough in a way that where, you know, whoever decides to do it, the enterprise leader is really on the spot. You know, that's the person who has to say, we're not going to say yes to the 17 requests for funding that have crossed my desk because we're going to sit down and first and figure out who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're, if you know, so you say, how do you get your organization to do that? Well, how much do you care? How much influence do you have? How effective a catalyst are you? Who's in it with you? Uh, in what context are you operating? How big is your organization? What industry is your organization? And I mean, all of, you know, you're into a major question. Uh, and on some level, you know, in fact, I was having a conversation about this just this morning with somebody uh, about our own firm. You know, to what extent do we care enough to um, really act as influencers? And to what extent is it, you know, we're just going to, you know, go along and do our job? And I think every individual who is a thinking individual, a feeling individual, in a company is perennially asking themselves this question whether you're you know a clerk in a store facing a customer across the counter or whether you're the CEO um, and I think most people actually are surprised I think enough a lot of people a surprising amount of the time answer that question by saying you know I'm here I'm, I'm gonna give what I have um, that doesn't mean I myself and like Don Quixote, you know, sort of changing the company for the better. Um, that means if I'm if I really am committed to my career with this company, or even to my career, I want to stop and think about, you know, what kind of wise advocate do I need inside myself? What kind of wise advocate can I play? What capabilities do we need? And then how is that conversation about our identity going to happen? 
and you know the answer is different for every individual and for every organization mm -hmm. so it's not a very satisfying answer but it's sort of the one we're dealt Adrian I see we're about a minute from close so I should probably give you the last word well, I just want to thank you very much, Art, and thank everyone who's joined us so far and who's going to be watching this later on. It will be available on YouTube. Uh, you will just, um, anyone who's registered, I'll just send you an email uh, probably sometime next week uh, with a link to it. But you can also just search Alia Webinar Art Kleiner and you'll be able to find this. So once again, thank you so much, Art. It's been really generative and um, wonderful and everyone and their beautiful, wonderful questions. And uh, I Thank hope you. to see some of you later on at Alia this June. Thank you. Thank you all.